Make sure to keep an eye on the Studios America podcast stream. We, of course, have this program for your audio listening pleasure. And also, brand new episodes of State of the Race starting soon. It's completely free, audio-only series. That will help you in the, uh, years, the year to come here with all the election insanity we're about to face. You can also watch this stupid show completely free on YouTube, youtube.com slash America. Just do us a favor and like the video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell for notifications, uh, and you'll get them when we post not only uh, the show, but also uh, some of the comedy bits we've got coming up. A really uh, good one coming up next week I think you're going to like. Uh, Charlie Spearing is going to be here to talk about our favorite vapid zilch in heels, Vice President Kamala Harris. Things are heating up in court with Fani Willis and her former lover. That was spicy today. It was amazing. We'll get to the latest on that in just a couple of minutes. But first, we're going to start by doing the Chiefs parade shooting. Obviously, a terrible situation. We talked about it briefly yesterday. And, you know, the, the way it was sort of being talked about is this uh, yet another one of these mass shooting incidents uh, where someone decided to take out as many people as possible. Obviously, a crowded area. These things can get really, really ugly. The number, I think, was 21 or 22 people who had been shot. I mean, it, you know, it's a, it a terrible situation. That sort of narrative from the beginning has sort of changed. And I don't know, it seemed one of the reasons, one of the first indications of this was when 21 people get shot, you're kind of surprised if uh, many of them are considered to not have life-threatening I- injuries. Now, it's, it's interesting if you look at the statistics on shooting, you actually survive it more often than you'd think. Um, but uh, it is one of those situations that when you're trying to kill as many people, obviously you're going for body parts that are going to cause the most damage. And when you have a large number of people shot and not as many uh, fatalities, oftentimes what you get are people who are caught in crossfire of a separate incident. And that does seem to be what occurred here. Shooting after the Chiefs Super Bowl parade seems to stem from a dispute among several people, police say. And we talked about this a little bit yesterday. We didn't know how this would uh, turn out. ABC News had a report uh, this morning that sort of outlined what the police believed. And at this point, authorities uh, tell me they, they don't believe this was an act of terrorism. But the police chief says th- there were multiple bad actors here who got into some sort of disagreement or argument and decided to take care of this and handle whatever they were arguing about in the middle of this crowd. We were here for a safe celebration. And because of two bad actors or more, it is why we're standing here today. There are some suspects in custody and a firearm has been recovered, Um, but an exact motive, why exactly they did this, still remains under investigation. So we don't have an exact motive, but it does look like it it was two or three people. Um, Some of these people were juveniles, it appears. Again, like, did a juvenile go into a gun store and buy a gun? I mean, it would be highly unlikely that that would be the way that this happened. Uh, so likely illegal guns, but we don't know all the facts on that yet. So an altercation here that gets out of control. People start shooting at each other, and sadly, there was a group of children nearby. All the children expected at this time uh, to make it, thankfully, um, but uh, it was really, really uh, ugly. And, and honestly, when you look at this as more of a interaction between two parties uh, here um, that may have, you know, there's some reports that maybe it was gang related, at the very least some sort of uh, just fight that broke out and turned into a gunfight. This is actually a lot more indicative of the actual gun violence problem we have in this country. Often we talk about these mass shooting events, someone going into a club or, um, you know, some crowded area and just firing randomly into the crowd. And we act like that's the big problem. Of course, we've covered this 100 times as a tiny, tiny sliver of the issue. These incidents are relatively rare uh, and they are a small, small part of the gun problem in the United States. And of course, we do have an issue with gun violence in this country. There's no doubt about it, but no one wants to actually deal with the actual problem. They want to deal with these high profile incidents where they, uh, you know, thrust all sorts of fame and notoriety on individual morons who want to go and just hurt people for no particular reason. That's not really a good summary of what our gun violence problem is in this country. Um, And it is interesting to see how slowly the information has come out. Now, I can tell you right now with uh, the utmost certainty that if the the shooters here were um, uh, big white guys in trucker hats that had uh, white print on a red background, 
um, that said make America great again, you'd know. You'd have, a, you'd have a very good idea what was going on and what the motivations are. Of course, we don't know that really yet. We don't know who the people were who did this yet. We don't know almost anything. And it is interesting how slowly this information seems to come out when a certain profile is not hit. Uh, these seem to be uh, people of color here, which uh, does not fit the uh, white supremacist narrative. It doesn't really fit any narrative the media wants to talk about. And of course, you know, the last thing in the world that this has anything to do with is race. This is uh, seemed to be uh, just people having some sort of a conflict that turned into violence. And of course, the people being shot at the, um, many of them who were being shot uh, at this were just innocent bystanders that had nothing to do with the conflict at all. In fact, the woman who was killed, the one person who did die here was uh, a popular radio DJ and uh, she was killed in this, uh, just a terrible, terrible incident. She had nothing to do with it, just caught up, as they say, in the crossfire. Now, this doesn't stop anyone from doing what they always do. And this is, of course, what President Biden had to do. Biden renews call for gun legislation after deadly shooting at Chiefs Super Bowl parade. Now, of course, by all indications, this was not a legal gun anyway. These were not legal weapons. Certainly, it is illegal to murder people. It is illegal to shoot people in the crowd. Um, it is, uh, there's no law on the books that we know of that could possibly have addressed this, but we're just going to say it anyway. Here he is blathering on, and you can tell he didn't write this because it's somewhat coherent. Uh, yesterday's events in Kansas City should move us into action. How many more families need to be torn apart? It's time for Congress to finally act to ban assault weapons. Uh, no indication an assault weapon was used in this case, of course. Limit high-capacity magazines. No indication that high-capacity magazines had anything to do with this case. Strengthen background checks. So you don't get background checked when you're using an illegal weapon. And keep guns out of the hands of those who have no business owning them. Now, of course, I mean, I guess there's a general idea that would, but I guess if no one, you know, if you were somehow able to craft a law that, that specifically kept guns out of the hands of people you didn't want with them, I guess you'd be, first of all, a magician. Um, but secondly, you'd have some sort of solution. Of course, that is impossible. You don't know that you don't want the people to have them. Uh, until afterward. And of course, if you're a juvenile, there's likely a high likelihood that the person who was firing the weapon shouldn't have had it in the first place. In other words, laws already prevented him from having it, yet the bullets seem to fly anyway. This nonsensical reaction, of course, is part of our country. Every single time one of these things come, uh, people just repeat the same nonsense over and over again. And I guess you get that everywhere. You even get it now in sports media because this was a sports tide story. How ESPN and Kansas City reporters reacted to the Chiefs parade shooting. Uh, here is uh, Adam Schefter, who knows a heck of a lot about, uh, of course, NFL uh, situations that are developing with agents and teams and signings. Maybe not quite as much about uh, the Second Amendment and gun violence, but uh, here's what he had to say. This is our country today, mm. unfortunately, where you have a celebration happening in Kansas City to celebrate the world champions, and a shooting breaks out to where now ABC News has confirmed that at least one person has lost their life. And so the Chiefs, I got a message, are okay, at least according to the person that texted me, doesn't seem like anybody from their particular party was injured or hurt today. But there are at least eight to 10 other people who were injured. There's at least one person today who lost their life. And we are left here now to try to make sense of this particular situation. These images are happening everywhere, all the time, every day, every week in this country. It's disgusting. It's sickening. It's enough. How many times do we have to see this everywhere? So today, it's the Chiefs' turn. It's at a Super Bowl parade. Tomorrow, it will be somewhere else. Somebody else will lose their life. Oh, uh, how profound. What a, what a profound statement there. Um, there you go, Adam Schefter, letting you know how disappointed he is in the country. Uh, and, uh, well... Luckily, we had even more of this, uh, and every time these things pop up, it's, it's labeled as profound speech from this guy, and incredibly profound blah, blah, blah about this guy. Of course, this is just nonsensical blabber.
Okay, nobody wants people to get shot. We all understand that. Um, But of course, you know, they act as if this is a a problem that is increasing. If you know anything about uh, gun gun violence statistics, you know uh, that is not accurate. It has been falling for multiple decades. That doesn't mean that these people have to know anything about what they're talking about. They just get to come on and just blather on about how profound and uh, these these meaningful moments and how we're just back in the cycle again. Tomorrow we'll see it there and tomorrow. Tomorrow we'll see it there. And let me go back to my mansion in my uh, Ferrari. Um, This is what happens over and over and over again. We get to hear these people make profound statements. Let me give you another one. This one is uh, Marcus Spears. This is who we are. This is who we are. So profound. now the the ever revolving cycle is gonna oh, start. Oh, you're gonna the tell news us that story. outlets oh. to talk about mm-hmm. gun control. They'll mm-hmm. have politicians on from either side Uh-oh. to talk about what needs to be done. Mm-hmm. The activism and people will speak out about we need gun control. And we then need what will happen? I bet something. And, and nothing will happen. We'll, we'll have the prayers up. I'm oh, sure that's pra- what's oh, happening. Oh, we gotta right mock now. the prayers. Prayers up. Prayers up. Prayers up. It's all mm-hmm. over the place. Yep. And it's unfortunate. Mm-hmm. And all the time, it's unfortunate. This is not an isolated situation in this country. No, it's not isolated. I know what I know what the cycle is going to be, and then we'll go back Tell us to about normal it. everyday scheduled programming. And oh, the problem mm-hmm. is, is that in these particular situations, when we have to come on television or anybody else has to talk about it that hates this part of what we are as a country, then it's it's always isolated. Well, it's this and it's that. The bottom line is that it happens too much in the country. That's the bottom line. Yeah. Now, yeah, well, it's uh, profound once again. Uh, hearing, I love how like all of these things are just saying like the same thing is going to happen, and people are going to do the same thing, and we're not going to do anything. And and that's 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 always how this goes on over and over and over again. And I guess that's I guess that's supposedly true. You know, um, of course, part of that cycle is everybody going on TV and saying that over and over and over and over again. It is tiring. Look, no one. Wa- no one wants these things to happen. But of course, none of these commentaries are realistic. None of these commentaries are talking about anything that means anything. I mean, I could certainly come on and say, you know, we keep seeing these things happen over and over again, over and over again. And we're going to have the same cycle over and over again. You know, once again, we saw it uh, yesterday, two dead, nine injured in a 35 vehicle pile up in California. Everyone just started screaming for help. And we're just going to keep seeing this again. You know, it's going to happen in another city tomorrow. It's going to be another car accident. And yet we're going to keep letting these four wheeled murder machines roll down the street and crash into each other. We're not going to do anything. No one's going to stop. No one's going to step up and do anything. And we're going to see it over and over and over and over again. You know, I, I, uh, we see this today. One dead, seven hospitalized after a suspected drunk driver slams into a park vehicle. Two walk, people walking got hit. We're going to see this tomorrow. And what's going to happen? The same thing in another city. And yet no one's going to do anything. No one's going to step up. No one's going to ban alcohol. What about, re- what about common sense measures? Like you can't go to a place. These bars are going to remain open. By the way, we'll have a Bud Light commercial coming up in about 10 seconds. But these bars are going to remain open. We are going to allow people to drive their murder machines on wheels in these in the after going to bars. We're not going to do anything. What about raising the drinking age to 26 or 36 or 50? What about we just ban alcohol completely? That would totally solve the problem, right? We've seen that over and over again. Remember when prohibition was here? All these problems went away, right? Remember? Remember? Well, no, no one remembers. No one remembers. That stuff doesn't work. We're in a country where... 400 million guns are already out there, okay? And you might say, well, that's why we need to get them under control. Well, tell me, explain your proposal that does such a thing. What we basically have are proposals to limit future purchases of firearms. So again, it goes from what, 400 million to what number? It's gonna be up. It's not going down from 400 million if you're limiting future purchases. And again, what they usually wanna do is limit the purchase of expensive weapons. Well, what, what happens when you do that? If you have 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 to spend on a gun, they say you can't buy that gun. What do you do with that $2,500? Most people are probably gonna buy two or three smaller ones. So you actually wind up with more weapons on the streets, which by the way is exactly what happened when they passed an assault weapon ban in the 90s. By the way, it did not change murder rates at all. It did nothing. The only thing it did do was it wound up killing more people with handguns 
and they died instead of from handgun fire than from assault weapon fire. It was a small difference, but that was the one difference that you made. And I know all those people who died from handgun fire were like, thank God I didn't get hit with an assault weapon because this death is totally different. Look, the goal here is to not be, live in a society that does not have guns. In fact, this is a society built on your right to own them. It's the Second Amendment of the Constitution. The goal, of course, would be to get to a place where people don't want to kill you. That would be a great place to be. Unfortunately, we don't live there. We live mostly there. We live in a society that's much better at having other civ civilians not kill you than it was just 30 years ago. It's definitely improved. But no, we're not there. We're not, we don't have as low violence rates as some other countries. Yes, there are differences. Of course, there is a price to pay for these freedoms. And unfortunately, sometimes terrible, terrible things happen because of them. If someone wants to kill someone, they're going to find a way to do it. We see this all the time. It's not always guns. There's lots of different ways this occurs. We live in a society based on trust. You walk into a grocery store, you walk by hundreds of people. Those people could easily kill you. None of them had background checks coming in. None of them were frisked for weapons coming into the grocery store. Terrible things could happen to you at any moment. You can't live your life, of course, fearing those things all the time because it'll drive you insane. But we have this sort of typical leftist approach to mock prayers and say, oh gosh, that's all we're gonna do is thoughts and prayers and we're not gonna do anything. We're not gonna do anything because we have this off the shelf solution. We could just reach up and grab right now and just solve this problem, but those evil Republicans and their darn gun toting voters won't go for it. It would be so easy, we could just do it. And then when you ask them to explain how they would do it, they got nothing. They've got nothing because this is not an easy problem to solve. If you want a free society, you're going to have a very difficult time stopping people from doing things that are terrible to other human beings. It is going to be very difficult to do. If you want to lock down like North Korea, you might be able to do, make some gains there, but are you willing to give that up? Are you? I'm not. I'm not. And I don't have to because we have a constitution that guarantees us these rights. What are they gonna do? They're gonna tell us all about all the things they're gonna do. Oh, we're gonna do background checks. Do you think the 15 year old went through a background check at a gun store? Do you think the 15 year old was out in his g garage in the suburbs 3D printing his weapons? Do we think that's what occurred here? Maybe we'll find out that's what it is, but over and over again, these solutions, of course, don't stop anyone but law-abiding citizens from actually getting these weapons. If you ban guns, we would have only people, of course, we'd have 400 million and there's no way you'd ban them and you'd know where you collect them without starting a civil war. But all that being said, even if you somehow did do it, you wouldn't, of course, close the border, so weapons would flow across the border and we'd have illegal immigrants and criminals with guns and you know, citizens without them. These are difficult problems to solve. These are difficult things to stop. Often, when, when these incidents happen, conservatives will say, well, you know, like, we have so many gun restrictions, people don't even have guns. But in this situation, even that doesn't apply. There are plenty of good guys with guns in that crowd. There were 800 police officers in that crowd. If ever, I mean, you could never come up with a better solution to stop shootings than putting 800 police officers and military members all around to stop the shootings. And yet, you still have shootings. It's impossible to stop completely. All you can do is the best that you can do. I mean, look at October 7th in Israel. They built a giant wall. They spent hundreds of millions of dollars on intelligence. Their military was looking at this area. We were told over and over again, it was an open air prison. And yet those people still came across and murdered thousands of people. Man's inhumanity to man has been a problem for a long time, boys and girls. It's gonna continue to be one for as long as you're around, I promise you. It's unfortunate, I wish it didn't exist, but even if you ban guns completely, they're still going to have that problem, which is a human problem. It's a problem that goes back as long as history has been recorded. If you wanna to try to stop gun violence, yeah, you know what? You can get your flex capacitor, you can go back to when they invented gunpowder, and maybe you'll have a chance. You'll lose a lot, 
in that period, a lot of advancements. So maybe you'll have a chance of stopping some of the gun violence, but you'll wind up finding that there is th these periods before gunpowder existed were incredibly violent. Go read about the, the, the biblical times. Lots of crap was going on. This is what human beings sometimes do to each other. And the media lets everyone down by not being honest about it and just saying, look, this is terrible. We're going to do what we can to stop it. But stopping future purchases of weapons for people who aren't even in the system because they're underage and buying illegal weapons, likely that came over a border we don't want to close, is not going to do anything for anyone. These things will happen. It is a part of life. We should just do what we can to fight it. But understand that with each one of these freedoms you give up, you're losing something. You're losing a little piece of your right as a citizen. And, you know, at the end of the day, we've seen these things spiral out of control in country after country after country throughout history. And I don't think the American people are going to put up with that happening here. Constitution wealth is the Patriot's choice in wealth management. If you are avoiding certain businesses who offend your values, let's just say we were just talking about the Second Amendment. How many times have we seen these companies who are like, well, we won't even let you use our credit card to buy a firearm. We're going to debank a company that does that. Do you want to be, after you're watching a news story about this and you're so angry about it, I'm, I'm never going to shop at that store again. I'm never going to use that credit card again. And then you go look in your portfolio and you've invested in that company. Why would you want to do that? You're, you're taking these steps that are important, and yet your portfolio doesn't reflect those changes. Constitution Wealth can help that all align for you. And also, by the way, still get really strong returns. You have to retire someday, but Constitution Wealth can help you reduce your investments in stuff like ESG and DEI and anti-gun stuff and, and uh, pro-abortion stuff and whatever, whatever type of thing that is passionate in your world, uh, they can help you avoid this is your opportunity to help build the parallel economy by working with an investment firm that is comprised of professionals who are patriots just like you. You can work with an advisor who shares your conservative patriotic values. Why would you work with anyone else? Go to constitutionwealth.com slash stew. Constitutionwealth.com slash stew. Get a free consultation today. Check them out. Constitutionwealth.com slash stew. I'm joined now by Charlie Spearing. He's a political reporter for The Daily Mail and author of the new book, Amateur Hour, Kamala Harris in the White House. An incredibly apt description of her time in the White House, uh, which you can pick up now wherever you get your books. Charlie, thanks so much for coming on the program. You bet. Thanks for having me. How are you? Uh, really well. And I, I'm really what a busy day today. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, it's been a crazy day. Every day is a crazy day these days, Charlie. Uh, I'm really glad that you wrote this book because Kamala Harris is somebody you know, I, I'll make fun of her word salads. I know uh, that's something that, that goes around a lot. But this is a person who is one 80-year-old uh, heartbeat away from the presidency. And there's been surprisingly little in-depth scrutiny of her career and, and path here and her beliefs. And you've done a great job going through all of this. What kind of prompted you to write this book? Thanks so much, Stu. Yeah, it really came down to, you know, not everybody gets a, a book written about their vice presidency the first few years of their office. But in Kamala Harris's case, it's absolutely a critical part of the 2024 election conversation. Uh, who is this woman? How did she get to be where she is today, despite her limited experience and her thin record in all of the previous positions that she's had? And so that's really where it came down to, is just answering some of the personal questions I had and just realizing there's so much more than just the word salads for conservatives to dig into and really find out. Yeah, it was really interesting as I was going through the book, there, there's a real consistent story arc with almost every part of this. And I want to go through some of the specifics here in a second, but there's this, I, this story arc of almost a reverse engineering a belief system. Like she seems to come up with a goal, a task, a, a job that she wants, a certain profile she wants to hit, and then sort of reverse engineer what beliefs she's supposed to have to get that goal. And it seems to happen over and over and over throughout her career. Am, am I looking at that right or am I just too cynical? That's exactly right, Stu. And when she ran for district attorney, she tried to steer a little bit to the center 
more more right than the, the leftist that was already in charge. The leftist, uh, you know, Terrence Hallinan, who was having a real struggle keeping crime and drug drugs and homelessness out of the city. You know, the mayor was angry with him. The elites were angry with him. And so she ran on the idea that, she, you know, we don't have to be tough on crime or weak on crime. We have to be smart on crime. And she sort of built her brand out, looking a little bit at the center and was not a progressive prosecutor like the ones we see so, so many of them today. Yeah, it's interesting. And she saw, you could see that she had battles with that during the debates when she was running for president later on, where she was trying to defend almost multiple different records at the same time, which I, I you know, it's understandable that you're going to get into word salad every once in a while when you're trying to do that. Um, let me go back to early in her career, though. You know, her relationship uh, with Willie Brown back in the day is something that she does not like to talk about. I mean, this is uh, this is the type of thing that is uh, sort of off limits if you're going to have Kamala Harris in an interview. You look back at this. I mean, how much of the rumors were true? How much of this was a uh, a real factor in her rise in California? Yeah, absolutely. She was just sort of a no-name district attorney from Alameda County when she first met Willie Brown. She was 29 years old. Brown was age 60. Brown was running for mayor, and she was, you know, just relatively unknown. But Brown needed a sort of a stable relationship to demonstrate to the people of San Francisco that he could carry a stable relationship with an adult woman. His wife, Blanche, was sort of long estranged, and Brown had the reputation of being somewhat of a playboy who couldn't stick with, stick with one woman at the same time. So Brown starts dating Harris, and then after that, uh, they date for about a year. Brown wins his... Uh, campaign for mayor, and he introduces Kamala to all of the great things that the political life and high society offer. And she really, he really opened the doors to her in a way like no other person has, especially with a romantic relationship. And not only that, she appointed Harris to, you know, some state board positions that paid a great deal of money. And I think there was, I tallied a 400000 over a period of a, just a couple years you know, put that, that was back in the 90s, put that in today's money, you're looking at almost $800,000 adjusted mm. for inflation. So that really is what helped put her on the map. Yeah, it's fascinating. She goes there, she starts her, her rise there. Um, as you mentioned, she gets to, to uh, she becomes the top cop, as, as, you, as you call it in the state. And she is kind of running as more as someone who is more t not, is smart on crime, as you point out. Then she decides to run for Senate and she it kind of reverses again. Right now she becomes someone who's on the left and, and a big progressive, sort of at odds with her previous life. And she's able to rise to statewide prominence uh, based on that. You know, these shifts are... I mean, she shows agility, at least <laughs> when it comes to her ideological positions. But why did the people of California buy it? Well, that's the thing. She had the help of a very powerful California firm out there and the consultants there sort of control Democrat politics in California. When you're dealing with a one party state, it's just a question of what elites are you going to get to back you and how do you convince them that you belong on the stage? It has very little to do with the voters of California. Once you're a Democrat, the voters of California are going to pretty easily um, vote for you. The, the, but behind the scenes, there's an entire different game being played showing up and, and Brown, Willie Brown taught Kamala that showing up and demanding a seat at the table is probably the strongest thing you have going for you. And she repeatedly did that in California. And she almost did it to Gavin Newsom when the two of them were facing um, the governor's race in California. Um, suddenly, Senator Barbara Boxer steps down, opening up that release valve for, for Kamala Harris to take her ambitions to the Senate. I, I kind of wish that bat the, the Newsom-Harris battle thing happened. That would have been really fun to watch, honestly, uh, in retrospect. Um, but so she, she's able to kind of become a senator. But again, you know, she's a senator from a state. There's no question really uh, as to whether it's going to be she's going to keep that job for basically as long as she wants it. She's not really notable until the Kavanaugh thing happens. And that's kind of when I remember her really coming on the national scene other than, you know, just yet another Democratic senator. She tries to really distinguish herself there by being, I mean, really over the top with the Kavanaugh thing, acting, you know, as if she believes every word of every accusation. Is this her, is she kind of had that mindset of like, this is my chance to grab the national spotlight and turn this into per perhaps a, an eventual presidency? 
Yeah, absolutely. It was a moment that she saw and really tried to turn into a national moment to sort of catapult her national political reputation as the, you know, the courtroom drama, the leader, you know, someone who had leadership skills, someone who was a prosecutor, had the history of being a prosecutor. So they thought that this was her attempt. But going back and looking over that record, it, it shows like she really made a lot of mistakes during that hearing. And especially when she, you know, insinuated that that Kavanaugh had had quiet discussions with with Trump's lawyers about the Russia investigation and even even suggested, you know, accused Kavanaugh of actually having these conversations. Kavanaugh didn't remember, but he didn't, you know, he didn't want to be led into a perjury trap. But Harris spent all of her time trying to convince people that she did, that there was a secret, quiet conversation collusion going on with Trump and Russia. Ultimately, she never revealed the source of her information and never even made an accusation. Reporters were stunned when that happened. They were shocked that she had no, no actual proof of anything, just a, just a slight accusation. Mm. Uh, so take me a little bit further, because this is what's interesting about the career arc we've talked about, where she kind of has this goal in mind and she retrofits her position set to win that job or get that advancement. This, you know, we can be kind of cynical about it, but it works over and over and over and over again for her throughout her entire career. In fact, it works all the way up to her run for president for, for the presidency. And it start even that starts out really, really good. Like she gets a big fundraising day. She has a nice big campaign launch. She has that moment with Biden at the debates. And then she finally hits that wall where this stuff doesn't seem to work for her anymore. And I don't know. I mean, it seems at that point she becomes unsure of herself. And that seems to have continued all the way here. She seems to be so protective of what she's trying to do that she can't even communicate with human beings anymore. Right. She you know, the reason she was chosen as vice president was because of her her credentials and her identity and the ability to speak to the country at a time when the world was on fire over the entire Black Lives Matter issue and the riots in the streets. So. You know, the Biden administration, the Biden or the Biden team at that point selected her to be the almost help Biden get across the finish line and and really bring them into to victory. So that's and yeah, now that she's been chosen as vice president, she really struggles in the role because she's no longer in control of her own schedule, her own calendar, her own staff. Now she's just trying to prop up this aging president who. At, at first, the, the team Biden had real reservations about her abilities and her skills, and they, they frequently didn't defend her when she came under attack. She was very aware of that, and she's really unwilling to go out there and defend the president and, and when they ask her to do it, unless it makes her look good as well. Yeah, because you paint a picture of, of a relationship that doesn't seem very strong. I mean, I, over and over again, she, she seems to be rejecting like responsibilities that are being assigned to her from the president. Like I, she doesn't seem to want to do any of this stuff if it puts her in any sort of bad light. What is their relationship like at this point? Yeah, I mean, when Biden picked a vice president, he wanted a buddy. He always considered himself a buddy of, of Obama, and he always wanted a, a similar relationship and, you know, told reporters that when he selected Kamala, that they would be buddies, that they would be friends, and they would work hand in glove on so many issues. But, wow, when they got into office, it became very clear that Kamala Harris still wanted to protect her reputation, wasn't about to take falls for Biden, mm -hmm. and still has a, has a very strong interest in preserving her career despite the position in what she sits in today. Mm. It's, it's a great book, and it's something that we need to know about because, look, if Joe Biden does somehow win in 2024, I mean, look, there's a real chance that Kamala Harris is going to be president of the United States, whether it's in that four years or after that. So... You better know uh, well, where she goes, how her, how, how, how her, uh, her brain works. Uh, and it doesn't look like it works very well at times, I know, but Charlie really does ex explain all of this really, really well in the book. Uh, the book is called uh, Amateur Hour, Kamala Harris in the White House. Charlie Spearing is the author. It's available now wherever you get your books. We really recommend it. Charlie, thanks so much for coming on the program. You bet, Stu. Thanks for having me. And then suddenly he's changing. Oh, no, it's Bonnie Willis. Her financial declarations. She's here. Same problems. 
We need her in here. She's impatient. She wants to get on the stand. Exactly what happened. Ah, she yes, this was the scene the today uh, in court. Uh, Fonnie Willis uh, really uh, wanted to uh, get on the stand and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. We have a, a lady here who really wants to be your next primetime host on MSNBC, and she did her big audition today showing uh, her amazing chutzpah. And oh, she was going to not take these allegations sitting down. How dare you ask her any questions? Here she is blabbering. Well, no, no, no. Look, I object to you getting records. You You've don't been get to object. You're intrusive little, no. into people's personal lives. You're confused. You think I'm on trial. These people are on trial for trying to steal an election in 2020. I'm not on trial, no matter how hard you try to put me on trial. So my question was... Do you have any problem? I object to getting any personal records of mine. We're not dealing with privilege through a witness. And I'm not, no, 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 I'm not dealing with privilege. What um, we had offered to put them in camera for the court to review, and I just want to know if she has any That's problem. That's something to do with a witness. Over and over again, Fonnie Willis would, ju would take a question that was direct and just roll with it. Now, if you know anything about when you're in these situations, you'd think as a person who constantly is dealing with courtroom situations, she would know you don't give more than you're asked. Like your job in these situations is to give as little information as possible. You're not there to make speeches. You're not there to accuse other people of things. You're not there to show how important your opinion is. You just want to get in and out because, you know, everything you say can be used against you. And it happened to her over and over and over again. There's a bunch of stuff she wanted to say. Now, there was another, one of her friends said that she had this relationship uh, back in 2019. She's trying to deny it. She's angry at her. She's angry at the attorneys. Um, she had a whole show. She had these things printed out. She brought props. I mean, it was a spectacle today. And she just kept going and running her mouth and running her mouth and running her mouth, a answering questions she wasn't even asked, constantly avoiding the question that she was asked. I mean, it was ever, like any honest person that was watching this and let's say wanted Donald Trump to be convicted and wanted Fonnie Willis to be seen as credible would be like, what are you doing? Please stop. Just answer the questions. Now, of course, CNN thought it was really good in this segment that I saw. Uh, but other than that, I, I can't imagine anyone thinks it was good. Here she is. Uh, this is what they actually got. It got so heated at one point, they had to just stop the entire proceeding. Point where Ms. Willis should be treated hostile. I think we. Well, I very Mr. much Roy. want to be here, so I'm not a hostile witness. I very much want to be. Not here. so much that you're hostile, Miss Willis. It'd be an adverse witness. Your interests are opposed to Miss Merchants. Thank Ms. Merchants' interests are, are contrary, contrary to democracy, Your Honor. Not to I mean, this is so. I mean, it's so cringeworthy. She wants these lines out there so badly. She wanted a bunch of information out there so badly. She over and over again goaded the attorneys to let her tell the attorneys about her breakup conversation with uh, Wade, the other, uh, the other prosecutor. They talked about all the trips they went on together. They met at the condo, you know, over 10 times, on and on and on and on. And she also very clearly multiple times tried to bring up the fact that he had some uh, male vitality pro problems. Now, it seems like she does not like this guy anymore. Uh, she kept bringing up how, she, you know, they stopped having sex. And, and that's when the, the relationship brought up, uh, broke up in his mind. But in my mind, it hadn't broken up yet. But that's just how men think. I mean, not stuff she was being asked at all. And then she said, I don't want to emasculate him by basically talking about the fact that he couldn't uh, uh, do things that males would need to do in the bedroom. Freaking sideshow. This woman is nuts and she killed her credibility today, uh, but she'll probably get a job at MSNBC. If you care about Donald Trump getting prosecuted for this, if you're on the left, you could not have been happy with the way things went down today, however. When you absolutely positively have to buy or sell a home, and let's face it, sometimes you just gotta, you're moving somewhere, you need real estate agents I trust on your side. It's Glenn's company. He started this a long time ago because he was tired of dealing with incompetent real estate agents. And he figured, you know what? Maybe everybody else is in the same boat. 
You know, maybe maybe everyone else has a problem trying to find the best ones as well. So he started this company and, you know, he, he knows that buying and selling a home kind of sucks sometimes. It's a lot of work. It can be confusing. You don't really know what's going on. You're at the sort of the mercy of your real estate agent who at least knows what the paperwork means. Uh, the agents that uh, work with realestateagentsitrust.com are the best in your area, no matter where you are. And they're top sellers. They know the lay of the land. They know the best practices to get you and your family where you need to go, whether it's across the street or it's across the country. Most of these agents are fans of the show too. So you'll have something in common starting right out. Do yourself a favor. Uh, check them out today. Get the best agent in your area. Don't settle for less. It's realestateagentsitrust.com. The name kind of says it all. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, we talked about the Russian weapon development yesterday, and we now have word as to what it is. Space weapons. Yes, yes. Russia has obtained a troubling emergency anti-satellite weapon, the White House says. They're basically saying, like, this is not something that's been deployed. It's a, a nuclear device that could take out satellites in space. I believe it's the plot of Goldeneye, in case that helps. Uh, they just basically are ripping off a Bond movie at this point. Good job, Russia. But again, like, very suspicious of the timing of this release. Again, is this something that we should think about and make sure we try to prevent in every way we can? Of course. But, you know, the fact that we're in the middle of, a, hey, we need $60 billion to stop Russia and we get this information, not exactly a coincidence, I don't think. Uh, more news from the Trump world. Trump's New York hush money case will start on March 25th. It's the first of his criminal trials. This is the New York one, probably the weakest of all the cases by a significant amount. Uh, and I don't think it's going to make much of an impact. It's about 40, 39, 40 days away, and that's jury selection. But this is going to be right in the middle of all this, and I don't know how often he's going to have to be there. Uh, it's going to be hard for him to campaign. They're just trying to, this is obviously a play to try to, to win the election. Um, he may wind up getting convicted of this, but uh, he'll have appeals and all of these other things. I, 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 the more and more I look at the timelines here, the more and more I think this stuff's going to drag out till past a lot of the election deadlines. Um, so maybe it won't be really that impactful. We will see. Uh, and Rashida Tlaib, and some people say this is bad news, but I, I want to I present it to you as good news. Rashida Tlaib um, decided to vote present on a, um, a, a, a piece of, uh, it was a resolution basically in the House that condemned the rape and sexual violence that Hamas leaders ordered. And you might say, well, wait a minute, voting present that's terrible. What do you mean? She's the only person who did it. She voted present. It was 418 to nothing was the vote. I mean, all they're saying is rape is bad. And she only voted present. But honestly, I think that's a real improvement to where I thought she was on this issue. Uh, I kind of, I thought she'd be the one voting for it and saying it's good. So the fact that she's just neutral on rape and murder is actually an improvement from where I thought Rashida Tlaib was, at least as it applies to Jews. Uh, that seems to be her generalized position. Eh, whatever we can do to make their lives a little bit worse is good. So the fact that she actually is stepping up and saying, hey, I'm just neutral on all that rape is a step in the right direction. Well, we have a brand new show on the blaze yes blaze tv has sarah gonzalez unfiltered i was telling her like I, I were you filtered before this because that didn't seem like you being filtered but this is apparently her unfiltered which uh if you know anything about sarah it's gonna be a lot of fun uh, sarah gonzalez unfiltered it's happening uh, right before this show on blaze tv you can check it out 7 p.m eastern uh, every night and make sure to check it out there or on her YouTube page, follow her, subscribe. It's a great show. I was able to pop on with Pat Gray earlier this week. We had a great time talking to her as always. Sarah Gonzalez, Unfiltered, only on Blaze TV.